All right, everybody. It is the third Wednesday of the month. That means it's time for the Kubernetes Office Hours, our monthly live stream where we hop online with a panel of Kubernetes experts and try to answer as many of your user questions as possible. So we are going to try to go for about an hour and answering your questions. So we are hanging out in hash office hours on the Kubernetes Slack. If you're on YouTube, follow the link below um, and the inviter there will send you a little e invite to the email address you provide. You can hop in the Slack channel, which we are broadcasting here on the side. Um, and uh, feel free to start typing if you are in chat where you're from, say hello. There's nothing we love better than to have that chat scrolling as fast as possible when we're having it. So um, welcome to everyone then to today's Kubernetes office hours. So before we begin, let's start by introducing yourselves. Let's go Marky, Chris, Mario, Pav, and Bob. Hello, everybody. My name is Marky Jackson. I am a Kubernetes contributor on the release team and also happy that everybody's here. Cheers. Hey, everybody. My name's Chris. I'm a customer engineer at Google and uh, most of my background is with on-prem Kubernetes uh, clusters, uh, as well as I've uh, done some time with the release team and uh, do this every month, which is always exciting and looking forward to helping out as best I can. Hey, everybody. My name is Mario Loria. I am a senior DevOps SRE engineer at uh, StockX uh, in downtown Detroit. Uh, I work on Kubernetes mostly in the uh, AWS EKS realm um, with a special interest in uh, networking, auto scaling and uh, deployments. Hello there, I'm Pavla Starsatskas and I work a lot with Kubernetes both as a user and an administrator. Uh, lately I've been contributing to Node Local DNS, Kubernetes Vertical Pod to Scaler. I also know a bit about Helm and Customize and various other Kubernetes tools. Hi, I'm Bob Killen. Uh, go by Mr. B Mr. Bobby Tables across all the things. I'm a research cloud administrator for the University of Michigan. Um, my sort of specialty is in the on-prem space, uh, along with uh, still a little bit of like multi-cluster and other fun random things. Bob is also Cillian fan number one. And I'm George Castro. I work at VMware as a community manager, and I will be your host. So uh, before we begin, we've introduced ourselves. Uh, if you're listening in on the Slack, feel free to say hello. Welcome back, Christian. David says, listening in for Virginia. Hello, thanks for dropping by. All right, so before we start, here are the ground rules. This is a Kubernetes event, so the code of conduct is in effect. Basically, please be excellent to each other. This is also a judgment-free zone. Everyone had to start from somewhere, so there are no dumb questions. Um, so please you know, help out your buddy by just having a supportive environment uh, in the channel. And while we will do our best to answer your questions, the panel doesn't have access to your cluster. So live debugging will be off topic. Um, we can't really like SSH into your stuff and, and fix it, that kind of thing. But however, we will do our best to get you at least moving in the next general step, next direction. Uh, panelists, you're encouraged to expand on your answers with your experiences, your pro tips, your production experience. And audience, you can help us out by pasting URLs to the official docs blogs or anything that might be relevant to the topic at hand. So this is something we do that's pretty cool. While the panelists are answering questions, a bunch of us are like furiously Googling that subject or whatever, people just start to put the URLs and stuff into the chat and that streams for the people that will be following it, like the video later on. And what I do is at the end of each show, I collect all of the URLs and then we slap that into the show notes so that we have a nice reference there moving forward. So the more links, the better. And also, we learn about new tools literally every time we do a session. So that's always awesome uh, when we can um, share expertise like that. So please feel to post your questions directly in the channel. Um, we have one question so far. Please just start typing away um, if you want. You can also post your questions on discuss.kubernetes.io, the Kubernetes forum, where I have a thread on this. And that's what we'll be posting the show notes. And I will link to all that stuff at the end of the show in the Slack channel and the YouTube notes. You can help us out by tweeting, spreading the word, paying it forward, doing whatever it is you need to do um, to help us get the word out. We always appreciate it. Um, and this panel is made up entirely of volunteers. So if you want to rotate in, please let us know. Uh, we love to have new people come in and help out. This is a great way to get involved in the Kubernetes community. Um, and a nice one hour a month commitment 
uh, to give back to the community. So we try to keep that on ramp slow. What happens is the week you tell me, hey, I'd be interested in this session. And then the week before I ping all the panelists and whoever can make it can make it. And whoever can't make it can't make it. Uh, but we have enough people to have a nice rotation going. So with that, before we start, I'd like to thank Giant Swarm, StockX, Pivotal, Pusher, Weaveworks, VMware, the University of Michigan, Red Hat, and Utility Warehouse. Ooh, and I forgot to add Microsoft um, for uh, allowing their engineers to uh, participate in our programs. We appreciate your support very much. And as always, special thanks to CNCF for sponsoring the t-shirt giveaway. So what happens is um, if you ask your question and we address it live on the air, we'll put you into the cool raffle. Um, then we roll a very, very scientific Dungeons and Dragons dice to determine the winners. And we will get you a Kubernetes t-shirt, which Chris is modeling today. Awesome. So I think that's the first time in a while someone's actually worn the shirt we give away during the show. I wore mine yesterday and totally forgot. So um, with that, we're going to get started. Panel, how are you feeling today? Audience, how do we sound? Bob has a quick, there's a quick thing that we want to mention um, concerning Kubernetes release cycles. That's a change for this year. So uh, we're just going to add a quick announcement. Bob, announce, and I'll get the questions. Right? Okay. Um, so with the global situation, we decided to uh, extend the 119 release. Uh, it will Who's no longer we? be... Uh, sorry. <laughs> we, we as in the, 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 the Kubernetes project, the, the release team... Right. Um, it was sort of it was socialized on Kubernetes Dev and so, several other places. Um, lots of people are, you know, being impacted by this, um, and in general, it just seemed like the the best bet for both our contributors and end users to not do a quarterly release. Uh, so extended by a month. Um, so this one twenty will also be. This one is extended a month. Yep. Okay. 120 will also be impacted and will, it'll likely also be a, a four month uh, release. Okay. So basically you're just going to add a month to each of the rest of the cycles this year. And then yep. they're all a month longer and that's three months. And that's usually one Kubernetes cycle. Okay. Good to know. All righty. With that, let's start with the first question from Christian Roy. Welcome back. Says, I want to change my single zone GKE cluster into a multi-zone. It looks as it seems I just have to check more boxes in the cluster setting and it will start more nodes in those zones. The problem is with the stateful sets with persistent volumes. Isn't it always? These pods will always start on the same zone where the PVs are, right? So my question is, is there some official guidelines about how I could redistribute my MongoDB replica set pods into multiple zones with minimal downtime and no data loss. So far I was thinking, make sure the PVs are in retain mode, delete the stateful set. In my case, I Helm three uninstall, make a disk snapshot using G cloud, create a new disk in the new zone using that snapshot, make a new PV using that disk, make a new PVC to use that new PV and then reinstall the stateful set and specify the PVC to use. Am I on the right track? Am I forgetting something? Is there something simpler or safer I could do? This so, sounds scary. Yeah, this sounds kind of, so I <laughs> think, think. What a great way to start. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, I think uh, Google uh, actually supports like regional disks. So you don't really need to actually, like you, if you would switch from zonal disks to regional disks, mm -hmm. uh, those disks can be mounted in different zones. So that would be one example. Uh, I think I can share a link to, to the mm -hmm. documentation around that. So that's like one option. The other option I think uh, you described is basically create three disks in different zones and mm -hmm. then just la launch an instance, one instance of MongoDB in one zone, another instance of MongoDB in another zone and yeah, et cetera. So mm -hmm. that's also an option, but again, it takes a lot more work. Okay. Does anybody... Uh... Are people generally just nodding or any, any more tips? Yeah. Any, uh, uh, the only thing I would ask is where you're storing that data. Like if you're using a local disk within the GKE node, you might be in a little bit uh, more of a painful situation, but otherwise, you know, if you're using just the uh, standard uh, storage volume with uh, GKE should be the situation Pavislav mentioned should work mm -hmm. pretty good. 
And just out of curiosity, uh, Mario, I know you're on AWS. Uh, this is just, can you adapt this same technique to AWS just using the AW EKS specific tools? Yeah, I think or? so. We haven't we haven't really yeah. done a ton with PVs, but there's the same sort of like EBS exists. If you're using it, it makes this easier. Yeah, EFS makes it even easier. Um, but if you're using something like Ceph kind of on top and just using node yeah. storage, it gets much harder. I actually just had a question yesterday from a friend who's running Ceph. And then so like he's looking at just upgrading the cluster, just the, the node, but like he can't do a standard like new node group move workloads over, right? Because that gets super tricky. So he's it's gonna take him like a month and a half to to do it. So yeah, same, mm. same, same thing I think here in the EKS world. Yep. And then Kirsten says standard storage volume, no local. That doesn't change your answer, does it, Pop? Yeah, so st standard storage, I believe, is zonal storage. So your choice is either, like you said, basically create a PVC on each zone or uh, switch to regional PVC. Mm. Mm. Okay. Any other tips here? Anyone actually has anyone actually done this? Like having to grow into into multiple zones or move from America to add in Europe or something or the other way around? Just curious. Not yet, but this is definitely something I'm going to try. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so. It's like, sounds easy as long as I don't have anything stateful. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If only. I've, I've yet to meet someone that actually has a 100% like stateless, stateless thing, but whatever. It's all good. All right, Christian, I hope that answers your question. Feel free to ask follow-up questions. So um, the, way, the way it works is as we're addressing questions, you can feel free to keep adding your questions. We'll add them in a queue. If you need something clarified or something like that, just uh, ask again in the channel and then we'll, uh, we'll go back to it um, and so on. All right, the next question is from Aaron Eaton. Thanks for joining us. It says, working with multiple EKS clusters and running our monitoring as daemon sets. Is anyone choosing to bake their monitoring, log collection, node metrics, et cetera, into their instance AMIs instead of relying on successful node bootstrapping to begin getting data? Is this a Kubernetes anti-pattern? Uh, just cause it mentions EKS and I live in this world. Um, I, I would kind of say anti-pattern. Um, I'm, I'm really interested in the reasoning why he wants to do this, but I mean, the, the default AMI is so, so I, I use EKS CTL, uh, and it just pulls the latest AMI that's uh, EKS enabled. Um, and it's, it's good to go from there. Um, mm -hmm. of course you could do bootstrap commands on that. You can tune Kubelet, uh, in your, your EKS CTL YAML. Um, but like, I don't really see a need to go off and create my own AMIs. That would be a, like a huge boatload of work. And like, I would really need a strong reason to do that. So I, I would recommend against it. I would, I would probably call it an anti-pattern, uh, in the cloud environment, at least. Um, if you want to do it, I mean, that's completely supported. You can, you can tell EKSCTL to use whatever AMIs you want. Um, but when you go off the beaten path like that, um, things get a little, little hairy and, and even support from AWS might get a little tricky as well. So. Mm. I would like so to you, second I, that. It is, uh, I, I've worked somewhere where we tried to do baking things. It became a massive overhead to try to maintain that. So I would, I would also strongly advise against doing that. So how do you all add your monitoring then? Do you have like a favorite Prometheus operator or something or? Uh, for us, we're not actually using Prometheus at the moment. Um, mm -hmm. We, I would, so we have a set of core services that are installed on every cluster create. And so we build a, uh, I don't know if you guys have heard of like Auto Helm or Reckoner, and there's a couple other projects that basically a single config file that defines multiple charts that you want installed at all simultaneously at one time. We use that okay. to basically define core services that are, you know, critical to the cluster operating for the workloads that we were putting on it. And um, okay. Prometheus would live in there. Um, there's also the Prometheus operator and, you know, Grafana and other things like that. So those would all kind of be accumulated in a, in a core set of services for us. I see everyone nodding. Anyone have anything else to add other than nods? Yeah. Any, anybody uh, using the operator pattern for this? I'm just interested because it feels like I usually read a lot of these monitoring tools or when you go to like install the default always kind of tends to send you towards the operator. So I was wondering if that's kind of the dominant pattern these days for this kind of stuff. But sorry, I interrupted you, Pavelos. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think like Prometheus operator is one of the first 
operators or maybe no SUD was the first one but anyway yeah and I think it's like high quality basically product so definitely check it mm -hmm. out um, regarding the like baking in monitoring system so like one big disadvantage of this is imagine if you need to upgrade your monitoring system now you will have to like roll the whole cluster because just to like update the image right mm. so that's like one big anti-pattern just due to this reason like mm. the, the typically the way we do things is basically we have like daemon sets which just run on each node and give give metrics back we have like prometheus which collects those metrics and that's it and you can like do updates test everything it's it's just like regular kubernetes uh, mm. deployments okay anybody doing totally separate uh, monitoring cluster I, we we talked a little bit about monitoring clusters last time so i just wanted to see if anybody's doing that or anybody in the audience i see people typing but we'll see okay all right well aaron i hope that answers your questions if you like your question if you have a follow-up feel free to uh post it that would be awesome moving on those of you just joining us welcome to the kubernetes office hours we have plenty of room in the queue today uh it depends usually usually we're like 15 questions behind so plenty of questions so feel free to ask your question and as always wait till the end and if you ask your question we'll give you uh we'll enter you in the raffle to win the kubernetes t-shirt all right moving on david asks Istio sidecar containers need to be privileged, which conflicts with my PSP policy. Is there a service mesh that does not require privileged containers? So um, I'm thinking like there is this uh, service mesh called Mayash. It's like there is ingress controller called traffic. Like I don't know how to pronounce it, but basically mm -hmm. they, they built a service mesh and it's non-invasive it doesn't have any sidecars so think i think that one is definitely shouldn't like require any special uh, mm -hmm. pod security policy mm -hmm. i'll add the link yeah awesome. there's also a, a console from uh from hashicorp uh it's console connect uh which is their service mesh offering and i believe it's uh based on uh node agents so it's effectively a daemon set um so that gets you away from the sidecar pattern uh, I'm not sure if that daemon set particularly uh, needs privilege access, possibly. Um, so definitely something to look at. But there are other options out there besides just Istio and Linkerd. Um, so definitely uh, take a look around. I'll post a link to a great uh, comparison uh, and breakdown uh, web page uh, uh, on this. So. Mm -hmm. Sorry, just trying to get. Uh... Let the Kubernetes dash users channels know that we are live and on the air to get more questions. Okay, uh, anything else as far as service meshes without privilege? Um, is anyone playing with Istio? I'm wondering why it's why it's like this. Is this like a temporary limitation? Is it designed like that on purpose? Like, do we know why it is this way? I'm very unfamiliar with Istio, so I was just curious. I think like last time I played with it, they were designing like a CMI plugin, uh, which is supposed to like solve this, but it was like in early beta. And mm -hmm. now like, I don't know what's the state currently in, but I believe it's still not like production ready. So basically once we finish this CMI plugin, I think you shouldn't be required to do any, any of that work. Uh, and then uh, FC says, I think he still needs to mangle IP tables and Max Guy, welcome back, says, yeah, it needs additional permissions to intercept traffic. Uh, Max Guy says, one could use OPA to have a little bit more fine grained policies than PSP, like allowing the sidecar certain capabilities, but not your workloads. And then Waleed, welcome back, has a link here on, it looks like just some general information. Thanks for that. I am uh, dreadfully behind on what's going on in Istio. Yeah, I've I've avoided <laughs> just because it's it's very heavy. Is it still is it still very churny over there? Uh, so, sorry, go ahead, Bob. 
Uh, no, you, you honestly probably know more about it no, than we, I do right we, now. We got plenty of time, so let's talk about uh, when you mess with Istio here. While uh, <laughs> audience, feel free to keep queuing up your questions. For sure. So I actually, I, I can't speak to Istio right now, um, but we actually just put together a test environment in our, our sandbox, and I, I built four clusters, and each cluster is getting a service mesh. And the, the four that we're going to test are Istio, Linkerd, uh, Kuma, and Console. Mm. And um, everything that I'm working with a teammate and everything that we read, Istio is always the much more complex. And there's so many uh, emerging third parties that are coming to like provide consultation and support and articles around installing Istio. And from what we're seeing, Istio still seems like the biggest lift to get going. Uh, and we're already leaning against it because we, we don't need something that complex really. Mm -hmm. And I, I can't see what added game we were really getting um, from using Istio over using uh, something like Linkerd, uh, right? By by adding that ad, you know that extra complexity. So um, I guess from someone looking in and like doing the research side of things, it just it already is kind of not looking great. Um, mm. So eventually we'll get it up and running. I hope to have more information in the in the coming months of our tests and whatnot. We're hoping to yeah, get I hope you write, write end that of Q three. Yeah, end of Q three. Yeah. We're we're hoping to do that and maybe do a blog post or something like that. So I'll keep everyone in, informed, but um yeah so curious what what criteria are you looking at like performance probably what else yeah um crap i'll, I'll pull it up right yeah, now just, really just give quick. us the general ones while uh while bob answers, yeah, for sure. answers his question here from bg chun is one uh talking about the announcement earlier is 1.19 release delayed for a month uh so Simple yeah question. I, <laughs> I i dropped the details into the thread um and linked to the release calendar it's currently slated to be released on august 4th mm -hmm. um you know assuming nothing has any problems along the way um oh wow that is a I'll, I'll i'll put i'll i'll get it okay <laughs> I got it. um we, we like the links, but not the Slack auto thumbnail thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I think everything is good in, in that thread. Usually we run on like a 12 week cycle and now it is 17 weeks. Mm. You think we'll stick? To, well, that's so speculation. That, <laughs> that will depend on the LTS. So there is an open uh, yeah. Kubernetes enhancement proposal to uh, for an LTS release of Kubernetes. And so the, the general consensus there right now is yeah. not necessarily an LTS release, but to uh, release, to have support for a year instead of uh, nine months. Right. Because I feel if I was an operator and I was like, hey, wait a minute, that's one less release a year I got to do. It's only one month per cycle. When, it, when you say it's only an extra month per cycle, that doesn't sound so bad, right? Yeah. Um, very interesting. I'm very I'm, interested I'm in favor in of it. how this will develop it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think the big thing too, from a, a cloud provider perspective is how they're going to handle an LTS release or the longer releases, right? So it, our release is going to last longer on, on EKS, for instance, and then they're going yeah. to put less effort into the, the newer versions sort of thing. Um, so will people sit on old versions for longer, right? Because mm -hmm. that, that, that extra month translates to multiple months in cloud providers zone, you know, so... Um, well, most of the cloud providers have been riding on the last release and even riding on the yeah. ones that have been out of support. Yeah, so I this, feel like this would give the cloud providers right. kind of a little bit more breathing room, right? Yep. It's like, right, yeah. yeah. Um, EKS just came out with 116. I believe GKE has 117 um, on, state, on normal branch. So um, to but, answer your question, George, just to, to finish up the close of thread here and on what we thought of were kind of our goals. Um, and this was specific to us, so we kind of just kind of got together and, and uh, got our brains thinking. Um, mm -hmm. MTLS is like an absolute thing. Um, we're looking at kind of an intuitive, a relatively intuitive UX uh, that that easily gets us the observability that we're kind of looking for of mm -hmm. what's going on. There's other products out there like Service Mesh Hub from Solo um, that are going to aid in that. We definitely want to look at that. Uh, Canary uh, and everything that goes with that, circuit breaking, uh, rate limiting. Um, the kind of intelligent retrying, I know Linker D has this uh, from a presentation that uh, Brandon did for, for our meetup. Uh, so, so kind of like those extra features around um, safety of influx of requests. Um, if there is a sidecar uh, being used, uh, preferably we want that to be Envoy, um, just from what we know and what we've used before. Um, ingress controller support, so we want to have the flexibility there. 
uh, mm -hmm. to you know ensure that it's going to work with whatever we want to do. We don't want something like privilege mode with what SEO is doing. We want something. We're, we're coming more from like a security and observability standpoint is our, our core um, uh, things that we care about. So um, kind of full declarative nature, ease of deployment, you know, so using Helm, something like that. Um, and then, you know, great interaction with maybe like Cilium or, or the AWS CNI or, or whatever we end up using. Um, I, I don't think there's much there that we really need to look at, but that obviously we just want everything to mesh really well. And if we can get added support continued from AWS and using their CNI um, mm -hmm. without, you know, losing anything, that, that would be a big thing. Um, I, I guess the last thing is kind of support. Um, Recently, as we've gotten bigger, we we do want someone to kind of lean on if something is not not working well. So, um, and it's not not that we need like four minute response times. Um, it's just that maybe if we want to ask wider questions around uh, something we don't really understand, we want to have someone to to go to for that. So we've been looking uh, from that side as well. So and Solo also provides that. I've I've links in here to Solo stuff. They're doing a lot of great work there. So. Um, but yeah, mm. so that was just our, uh, and, and we're actually going to plan some some testing and benchmarking uh, as well. So uh, pretty thorough. That is awesome. So if you'd like to see Mario write up the results of his thing, um, feel free to leave an emoji on the message that I left in the Slack. So uh, actually, I'm bringing that up for two reasons. I know a lot, a lot of, a lot of those, ugh. A lot of you out there doing this professionally and stuff, and you get to do cool things like a bake off and things like that. The Kubernetes blog, anyone from the community could submit content to it. So if you're doing stuff like this, that's like pretty awesome and you think it will help someone um, and you have no idea how to get started, you can always just ping me and I'll, I'll send you to the blog uh, submission guidelines and show you how to kind of like do that. It's always really cool if you can um, kind of take a page out of the SRE book and share with all your buddies. So I'm really looking forward to seeing how that works out for you, Mario. So, um, Istio console and the other two are Linkerd and Kuma with a K. If, if, if someone could drop the links to that um, in the channel, that would be fantastic. And then we move on to the next question. Let's see. Let's just see what people are saying real quick. Any Anything left to say about Istio? Wally says, according to ThoughtWorks, Istio is getting much adoption. Um, and he's got a link to a bunch of articles there that if you're listening uh, to this about Istio, you will definitely check those out. And I'll make sure that... Um, those links make it to the show notes. Um, so this is interesting. This is, before we get to the next question, I wanna talk about this a little bit. Uh, Kubernetes uh, Long says, Kubernetes on Docker for desktop on Mac broke and could not because k.io went bad yesterday. Is there a dependency that anyone would know of Docker for desktop Mac needing registries to set up? Just curious um, how the outage yesterday has affected anybody. Day. Or is there anything you could do as far as your local laptop to, like, is there like a proxy thing you can run on your laptop or something to cache images or something? I or have no no idea about there any best practice Docker <laughs> Docker desktop with that, yeah. but like, um, usually like uh, less so for desktops, but at least running mm -hmm. a pull through proxy or you know having a local registry for your clusters. Yeah. Does anyone have any recommendations for a pull through, for a for a proxy or is it just like any one of the generic ones can do it? Or is there a specific, is there some cloud native thing I should know about that I should be checking out? I am pretty sure Harbor does it. Harbor, okay. Any other options? Um, some type Nexus, uh, a, a bunch of them support that sort of thing. Okay, just curious. Yeah, if, any, if anybody in the audience has opinions on these, those would be great because that's something that's kind of timely and would probably help people out to, um, remove another external dependency from your life, which is also awesome. All right, moving on. FC, welcome back, says, any idea if how Ingress API might develop in the future? Seems like a lot of edge proxies have ditch consuming Ingress resources in favor of their own custom resources. Good question. I have seen this uh, mm -hmm. where it seems people are doing a lot more CRDs, however, there has been uh, improvements to the Ingress API, especially in version, uh, I want to say 117 or 118. I'm going to double check that. Mm -hmm. But if I recall correctly, there was something that was done in one of those versions with better path matching configuration. There was none, and I'm still trying to find it, the actual mm -hmm. release notes for it. But I know 
in 117 or 118, there was actually work done to uh, improve that. Mm -hmm. I found it. Uh, I'll, 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 I'll drop a link. Gotcha. Cool. Also, I, I believe uh, Kubernetes folks are co currently working on a new sort of service API, which also includes like sort of next generation of ingress, which will have sort of similar feeling to Istia. It will have like gateway resources and things like that. Um, I'll drop a link which sort of talks more about it. Anybody else on this one? All right, and it looks like we have a lot of information here about registries that I'll just go over here real quick. While he mentions K itself is open source now. Uh, Max Guy says GitLab has a built-in Docker registry. It's easy and he, he links to the docs. Um, Harbor has an open issue for it. Rob mentions that Dims wrote a migration mitigation script to migrate the images from K for the Kate's project, and they are looking for it now. Here's some links. These links are fantastic, everybody. Keep them coming. It's good. Um, in the meantime, we will move on to the next question. Have We haven't missed any questions. Arjun's question is next, right? Let me just double check. Yeah. So Arjun asks, what's the difference between not setting a CPU limit and disabling CFS quota at the kubelet level? Follow-up question is also, or do you want to answer this one first and get to part two? Or do you want me to just say the whole question? Okay. Also, since CPU CFS quota period is configurable, what would be the right value for this? Does the default 100 milliseconds work well for you? Uh, they are on 2004, kernel 5.4, and 1.18.2. Any opinions here? Um, I might just be, I, I feel really stupid asking this. What does CFS mean? I think that's the, uh, the kernel schedule, right? The completely fair, completely fair scheduler thing. Not setting CPU. So a very wise person once told me just not to mess with the kernel config for Kubernetes, just make sure swaps off. And then yeah, I really the don't system know level stuff, but that sounds naive depending on your environment. Yeah. It, it, <laughs> you definitely tweak that in large environments. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know why he's looking at. So I've seen some talks that uh, say that basically if you tweak uh, contain container CFS uh, period seconds to a lesser value, you mm -hmm. have like a better performing cluster because uh, basically Linux won't throttle your pod uh, that 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 much often. But mm -hmm. um, again, it sort of depends on how are you, like if you are com com comfortable with that, like because CFS is a hard system to, to configure and get right and Mm -hmm. Yeah, like I would definitely practice that before than actually like, yeah, just running out in production. Uh, yeah, so, and the difference between like disabling CFS and kubelet uh, and the sort of setting the limits on the pod is basically uh, if you disable the, disable it on the kubelet, that kubelet won't throttle any pods, which means if somebody sort of incidentally uh, deploys the Bitcoin miner or something or something goes like to 100% CPU, it will probably like you'll have like a responding node or something like that. So you won't have that extra protection from the kubelet side. Mm. I know one like sort of along the same lines, um, you want to tweak or disable it for if you want to ensure that your workloads remain, remain on the same like CPU core. Um, mm. This is more so when it comes to, you know, when you get into like NUMA management and workload placement, like it's, it's more important in very intensive workloads mm. as, as when you'd be tweaking those things. Mm -hmm. And Waleed mentions that this is the default scheduler for the kernel, right? I'm just wondering, these, are these different between different Linux distros? Uh, so this, I wasn't necessarily talking about, there's, um, uh, one sec. 
Hold on, I'm totally running it on my machine to see what my default schedule is. So I'm on 2004. Mine's I have the deadline scheduler. Yeah, you see if the on the actual like host kernel itself that isn't used so much anymore. Okay. Um, I know that you can set the CPU manager policy on on Kubelet for that sort of thing though. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, so we have some comments here from the audience on this one. Let's see. Um, Alex Brand links to an issue that has a lot of background on this, a tad long, but an excellent read to better understand how Kubernetes and CFS works together. Thanks for that, Alex. Appreciate that. Joel says, in most cases, you leave the CFS quarter alone, but it can cause latency. We've had this problem where we would see 700 millisecond tail latency, lots of hops for microservices, all getting throttled for like 100 milliseconds at a time. Bring the quarter down a latency drop loads because they were being paused for, paused for less time. Best practice these days, teams to just turn off limits. Um, Pavas Labs has dropped a link there about some good slides about tuning CFS. Um, Arjun says Spring Boot ASAPs apps need more CPU. And if you set a limit, the apps get throttled and the startup takes more time. That sounds like something we've heard before. Um, wow, this GitHub issue is long. But some good reading there. Um, Wow, there's a lot more information on this than I was expecting. Um, any any other uh, information here? Yeah, the GitHub issue itself has links to tons of stuff. And then there's 435 hidden items. So we're not gonna review that uh, <laughs> during the show, but hopefully that is more information and that answers the question for you. Arjan, feel free to um, post a follow-up. Um, Joel just mentions, I know Zalando and Pusher, both big advocates for the initial CFS quota implementation, have all turned off limits. Um, Arjun says, we are also planning to turn off the limit for now. And then Walid has more information on some bugs related to CFS found on that Medium link there. Wow. All right. I'm going to have to read that up. I didn't know, uh, I didn't know this was such a... Um, Lots of links here. Yeah, yeah, that's just, man. Um, well, here's, here's a TLDR for, so we would recommend removing CPU limits in Kubernetes or disable the CFS quota in the Kubelet if you're using a kernel version with the CFS quota bug unpatched. There are seriously known CFS bugs. So definitely check out that article to see if that affects your environment. Um, all right, our next question is more ingress. Quick side note, we are definitely working on an ingress session. We have one penciled in for early next month in June. So we're gonna have a session that's gonna be nothing but ingress. We're gonna have panelists from SIG Network joining us. We'll give away t-shirts, it'll be fantastic. So it'll be just like this. Um, we will be doing the normal office hours next month as well. Excuse me. So um, just um, pay attention in the channel. I'll be make sure that I spam the information when that date is set. But moving on, we do have an ingress question here says, what's the correct fee from Long asks, what the, what's the correct behavior when there are two ingress rules which match the same host plus path, but target different services which target different sets of pods? A, both get traffic equal share for the pod. B, only one of the services get traffic. Which one, the first one registered? Who wants this one? I think it's the last one registered. I think part of that depends on the ingress controller too. Someone who knows more than me should talk though. Mm. Yeah, I believe this is like one one sort of thing where it's like unspecified behavior. Like all the ingress controller are gonna like do whatever we want with this. Mm. I, I So we use Nginx ingress, which a lot of people use and it's the last one applied um, for us. Um, because mm -hmm. that's partially how Canary works too. So um, that's probably the one that's going to take over completely. It's not going to be like, there won't be any merging, right? It's just going to be the last one. What's defined there um, is what lives, so. Oh, this is interesting. Yeah, to come back, uh, Long also mentions that on the latest distributions, NF tables is causing broken CNI network and bonded infants require bridge set to active passive mode. None of this is detected by cube admin during installation. 
I personally have had three such cases in last week. I also heard Kate's handles it, but just four days ago on Debian Buster. Um, Long, do you know if there's a bug reported for this? I feel like um, I should ping someone on the Cube Admin team and let them know that this is an issue out in the wild. Um, so if someone can find a bug for that, I'd be happy to point the right resources at it. Or if not, maybe we should file one. Um, but hopefully that answers your questions about the ingress rules. If you have a follow-up, please post. Uh, next question comes from Daniel. Says, is there any reason for me to use ingress instead of load balancer service if I want a dedicated NLB for the service? I also want TLS termination at the NLB. Whoever answers this, please um, let us know what an NLB is for those who don't know all the acronyms. Um. So an NLB is a network load balancer. It's a uh, logical abstraction in AWS land. Mm -hmm. uh, they operate at layer four, um, but they also handle TLS termination, um, which is cute. Um, <laughs> uh, we don't. We actually just use them for layer four functionality, um, and they route right to our clusters, cluster nodes, uh, and they have by default health checks for each of those nodes uh, where we're running Nginx ingress as a daemon set. So mm -hmm. um, I can't find the question because I'm blind today, apparently. Um, can you reread that, George? Sure. Or... Is there any reason for me to use ingress instead of load balancer service if I want a dedicated NLB for that service? I also want TLS termination at NLB. No, I would say just go, if you really just want to use the NLB and um, TLS termination with the NLB, then just use that. Um, there will be some manual configuration as NLB support uh, with ingress definitions isn't exactly there for all the features. There's the kind of like you can enable it, but there's not much else you can do. Um, note that NLBs are different from um, the ALBs and ELBs are no longer a thing. They, they still exist in a lazy mode, but ELBs are no longer a thing in AWS. Uh, it's either ALBs or NLBs. So ALBs do give you a lot more flexibility though. Um, so I, I definitely like if you're looking for more layer seven flexibility, um, definitely consider an ALB, but there's also a little bit more to set those up as well. So is there a um, price difference? Sorry, I just had to know. Absolutely. Yeah. ALBs <laughs> are, are much more money because they're layer seven, right? They're more control yeah. over your, your traffic. Um, NLBs are great though, because uh, you if you have your, your ingress controller that's doing layer seven already, you don't really need that. So uh, the other the other side of it too, is that NLBs are just as redundant as ALBs. Um, you can do cross zone load balancing with them as well. So from an ingress perspective, they're, they're just as, as good. Um, mm -hmm. So. All right. Anybody else have an opinion on this? Bob had to leave. So thanks, Bob, for dropping by. I do have uh, one thing regarding NLB versus ALB. Uh, mm -hmm. Something to consider with NLBs is if you're using sort of a uh, like a web application and you mm -hmm. need sticky sessions, that's a problem with NLBs. If unless they fix that, but at last I remember they did. You do not have the sticky session available and sometimes you need the uh persistent session to go with your web app and you, you're definitely going to want an alb in that regard hmm. all right any other opinions on here and caroline wants to ask slash mention is it a travesty if i decide to split traffic between all the matching pods in my experimental ingress controller this seems to be the sanest way for me. This is talking uh, with regard to the last question that we had. Does anyone have an opinion here? Split traffic between all matching pods and my, I mean, no, I, I guess do whatever you want. I would say use labels though and be very explicit with what's going on. So when you're troubleshooting and trying to understand uh, where things are going, logs, et cetera, you, you have a little bit more to go on. But um, you know, we, we've done Canary with Nginx Ingress and that works fairly well, but I mean, it's all just really labels um, to, to different um, backends. So separate Ingress definitions, et cetera. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I guess being explicit, you know, do whatever uh, you need to, to get the job done, so. Hmm. Anything else Ingress related? All right, and Max guy who looks, who looks a lot like Charles Leclerc, like the F1 driver for Ferrari. Just saying, Max. 
Uh, says you can use OPA to block kind call and ingress with the same hosting plus path. There's a tutorial for something similar to that in the OPA docs. And then he has the links there. Thanks for that. Um, Waleed has a question for a friend. So Waleed, if you win the shirt, you have to give it to your friend. Uh, do you have some idea about load balancing gRPC and EKS? In GCP, it's not an issue as I'm doing gRPC microservice and microservices. And since it uses HTTP2, this will become as the traffic will be load balanced before establishing the connection. But once the connection has been established, there's no load balancing and doing server-side load balancing, it doesn't make any sense. So the alternative is to use something like Nginx, STO, Linkerd, et cetera, but can't seem to find good docs for it. Have you ever done this or know how to do it? And if possible, direct me towards some good resources that could help in my case. I have to re-dissect this question. Um, so, like, basically, the issue is um, because gRPC uses HTTP2, uh, basically, it requires layer 7 load balancing. And if you are using, like, regular cluster IP, like the regular service in Kubernetes, it will have a sticky session to, to, a, to a pod. So, basically, if, if one client sends to traffic to that service, it will load balance to one pod, and that and and it won't basically it will always keep that session open and it will just always send uh, all the requests to that single pod uh, the way we solved it is basically you can configure grpc to basically do a dns lookup uh, find all the pods and basically just sort of send uh, the requests uh, basically round robin fashion to all the pods there mm -hmm. That's awesome. I was kind of like questioning what was going on with this with this question. Oh. Yeah. Looks like it was tele telephoned over to us. Any other opinions here? Um, I know you're cutting up Mario, but uh Audience, we're cut up on questions. So if you have any, we have time for maybe one or two more before we get to the raffle. And then we'll start to wrap it up. All right, Arjun, next question. What's the right approach to have time synced in the pod? Just set the time zone or use NTP client and configure or mount hosts Etsy local time or something else? How do you all do this? Is there any is there anything special that you even need to do, or like does the default host OS just handle this for you? I've seen in some in most cases that I have personally dealt with, we use NTP. Yeah, I was gonna say my labs host. You know, admittedly, I only have like a home lab, but I just use the host NTP it tends to come by default. Set to UTC, of course. Anybody else have opinions here? Yeah, I'd be I'd agree with uh, y'all. I seem to remember there's a question similar to this a few few sessions back, where things were a little yeah, out I, of sync. But I, so I'm trying to remember. Yeah, I think the question is, Arjun, is do you have to have the NTP client set up inside a pod? I don't think so. Um, so, so yeah, I don't, I get, I don't, so. yeah, yeah. I was gonna just ask, like, I mean, what's happening? by default without doing anything? Isn't it just inheriting the the local time from the, the host? Uh, I just tried to cat Etsy local time in one of my pods and I don't see it, but like when I run date, what's happening, you know? Yeah. Yeah, so I believe- Right, it takes a of, host time. Yeah, yeah, it takes a host time from, it basically just makes a syscall to get the time and then like kernel response from the host, here is the time for you and that's it. So basically if yeah. you're having time sync issues, look at your hosts. Yeah, because I, I know Power OS and like Flatcar and stuff definitely is using NTP by default because I see it. I just happened to set that up yesterday and I was like, oh, neat. Um, yep, so Arjun says host time is synced and correct. So is there another problem? That's interesting. I wonder if, if that's just a symptom then. Um, so I see Arjun is typing. We'll get back to them there. Uh, Mioza says, what I need to join the raffle? You have to ask a question during the show and uh, have us 
address it, but don't worry, we give away two every month. Uh, let's see. So while while uh, Arjun is typing, let's address Daniel's question real quick here. Is there any recommended way to handle a huge spike in traffic in Kubernetes? We have HPA set up, uh, but we have to deal with spikes at certain times. I'm looking for STH, like scheduled pod scaler. I, I think Mario has experience with this. How's your Black I, Friday? Well, yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I don't, we have tuned HPA quite a bit and we've done as much as we can with HPA. We're starting to move to custom metrics, which will help, um, which we, we have th provided through Datadog, uh, which is, which is great. However, that's mm. still reactive. Right. Um, and so mm. in order to be proactive though, um, we do have um, feeds from um, marketing and we have kind of a webhook service set up and we've just finished uh, a service that tunes uh, the uh, HPA definitions, uh, min values. Um, at certain times uh, prior to a push notification going out. And a push notification is, let's tell 4 million people that a new sneaker has dropped, right? right. Um, and so we, we, 10 minutes prior to that, we you know, double the size of a deployment, let's say. Uh, mm -hmm. And so we, that's kind of the model. So we built this in-house. We're looking at possibly open sourcing it. Uh, when we get there, uh, there needs to be a lot more work done on it. But right now there's nothing that like, there's no GitHub project that I could find um, that that does this. Um, there is, and I, I will link it in the channel, a predictive auto scaling uh, kind of um, AI sort of model. Interesting. Um, okay. Or I should say ML sort of model that yeah. someone is working on out there. Um, there's also spot.io, uh, which used to be spot inst um, that handled uh, using spot instances in AWS. They're now getting it more into um, visibility and application auto scaling, and they've just kind of rebranded uh, a spot. Uh, they've got uh, something they're claiming that does uh, does this as well. We're looking into that, um, where it does kind of predictive uh, mm -hmm. auto scaling um, based on obviously past past performance and and influx of yeah. traffic and and things like that. So um, you know, predictive auto scaling is one of one of the things. So um, you know, it's not going to be perfect. I think if you have some sort of feed, um, you can probably fairly easily write something to to do this. It really mm -hmm. isn't that difficult. You're just kind of taking in a call. Uh, you're setting a schedule and you're making a call to the API, right? So, mm -hmm. um, but yeah. Well, so assuming more, more you know what the, assuming right. you know what the schedule is. <laughs> sure, sure. Right, right. Like you, obviously someone is thinking in your organization to let you know ahead of time, right? Yeah. So I, yeah. I'm sure there are I, plenty of cases where you get caught by surprise maybe. Yeah. Whenever you guys are trying to buy sneakers and uh, it's real slow, you'll, you'll see that. Right. Or um, maybe it's, maybe it's a surprise, like for example, Right, if, if an MBA star says, "Hey, I like this shoe," yep. on Twitter yeah. or something, and links to you, yeah, the Last Dance, the the TV yeah, yeah. series, you know, stuff like that. Um, so it's like you, ha I think you have to really dial in your reactive auto scaling uh, right. before you can start thinking about the the other side of it. Because if you're not reactive yet, you're, I mean, you need to solve that problem. Um, mm. Being proactive is kind of like the the sugar on on top that that helps when you know, but you're not gonna know. Uh, a yeah. lot of the times when you yeah. do actually incur downtime. So, um, yeah. Okay, so you don't have to answer this, but are you saying that the Michael Jordan documentary is increased your load in your Kubernetes cluster for people trying to buy Jordans? Because that would be I, the coolest I, thing you've told me this month. No, yeah, I, I, it has. Um, the amount <laughs> of Jordans trading on the site, our, our trades are, are looking really good. Yeah, I mean, I would say yes. <laughs> there have been auto-scaled workloads on our Kubernetes clusters because oh. of a documentary. Yes. Okay, I need to <laughs> I need to go buy some sneakers then. Okay, all right. We are running out of time here. Uh, let me see if uh, our John here has followed up. Uh, it says, I will check again. By default, most of the images come with UTC set and our hosts are using CET. So generally, I see a time difference. When I set the time tone to CET in the pod, I see the right time. I just want to confirm this is the right approach. What do you all think? I have always defaulted to just UTC for everything and not even bother with a time zone on my hosts. Is that, is that a thing? And then in my brain, I just kind of have a UTC calculator. How do you all do it? I'm same with you. I just, yeah. 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 see. I just hate everything about time zones in general. Okay, so we are running out of time. Those of you that have asked questions, we are going to go live again in about another two hours for the West Coast edition. So there are some questions here 
Um, if you're not, if you can't make it to the next session, um, I will definitely queue up your question. So definitely, uh, Nerdy Sean, your question is next. Muses, I will definitely make sure we ask your question this afternoon. And it looks like Long has some more questions as well. So unfortunately, we have to take it. We have a hard cutoff. So uh, we need to take a break. We will queue up those questions. As always, I will take all of the show notes and links and publish them uh, with the show notes in this YouTube video. And I will post that in the channel. Um, and as well, all of these are always recorded and put on the playlist on YouTube. So you can always definitely go back and check them out. Um, ooh, well, he says, it is hard. We use time zones. Neat. Um, Awesome. And then Tim Hunter, I see your question. We will definitely address that in the next one. So thanks everybody for coming. Let's do the quick raffle here. Hey. Ready? Okay. So the first winner is Daniel. You've won a Kubernetes t-shirt. I will PM you after the show. Uh, to give you that information. And the next one is... Eve C, you won a t-shirt. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. I am not sure if you won a t-shirt before or not, um, but if you did, we'll go ahead and run the raffle in Slack afterwards. Um, so I will PM both of you uh, the way this works is you go to store.cncfio, I give you a code and you get a t-shirt. Um, if you're not aware, you can any of you could go to store.cncf.io and they sell tons of cool Kubernetes swag, including this hat, which is one of my favorite things. And of course, Chris's shirt that he's wearing uh, today. Ooh, it is your first time, congratulations. I know you've been watching the show for a long time, so I'm glad, glad you finally won the shirt. And with that, we'll be giving away two more shirts uh, this afternoon, so we'll, come back in uh, two hours. And remember, it's always the third Wednesday of every month. Feel free to hang out in the office hours channel. Um, it's a lot smaller than the Kubernetes users channel. So, um, you know, if you're feeling overwhelmed or it's too flooded or you can't get your question, um, you can just ask questions there. And every month before we start a new show, we go back and we look and see if there's any questions we can address. So with that, thanks panel. Panel, any, any last words? Famous last, Mario's like, keep on buying them Jordans. I just want to say really great questions from people. Um, I love the, the ingress and some of the cloud questions, um, but the off the wall questions like the uh, nice shoes, nice shoes, uh, <laughs> like, the, uh, <laughs> like the like the time zone stuff and the CPU. I, I have 47 new tabs just from this last hour, I think of stuff that I need to research now. So I, I love it. So thanks to everyone who participated. Yeah, yeah a lot of great links. The, the, we always get a lot of links, but a lot of good ones this time. This is like the first time I feel overwhelmed. Um, I got a lot of homework on the CFS stuff I got to catch up on. All right. And with that, we'll see everyone in two hours. Thanks panel. Thanks listeners. And uh, keep on, keep on trucking, keep on deploying. Everybody stay safe out there. Thanks panel. Stick around.